by the browser. I think that has helped in the past. Oh, look, maybe we can just do this. Looks like my slides are actually visible to you guys. We're, we're going to just roll with those. And uh, let's just go to the next slide. Let's get going. I'm feeling great. It's a wonderful day in New York. It's sunny. It's beautiful. We've got spring coming. And we've got the world's biggest announcements lined up as usual. The, this week's big announcement was the partnership that we announced with Terra. Terra, as you know, has been ripping. It's part of the, the, uh, the Soluna Vox uh, trilogy. I don't know what, what the deal is with that trilogy. Those three things couldn't be more different from each other. Solana is a monolithic, old school, well engineered, but you know, a single chain to rule them all kind of a system. Uh, and uh, they're dealing with currently adding TCP. We've added TCP. We got that covered. <laughs> we already have that. We don't have to reinvent the wheels. Uh, you know, we know the wheels. We know how to use them. Um, in any case, uh, they're dealing with slowdowns because of some inherent things that they that they built into their protocol that, you know, we, we knew were going to be unstable. And, and they've been dealing with those instabilities for some time now. Power to them. Wish them the best. Uh, Luna is very different. It's a two coin system. UST, which is a stable coin, algorithmically it's stabilized. And... Uh, and the, uh, the, the Luna tokens from the Terra system overall. And it's a two coin system. One of them is supposed to go up and down to absorb the volatility. The other one is, is meant to remain stable. Let's talk a little bit about stability at the end and, and algorithmic stable coins. It's an interesting topic. It's a broad topic. It's an interesting technical topic. So let's touch upon it. Uh, but the big thing for us, from our perspective, is that we're announcing this giant uh, partnership with Do Kwan and friends. Uh, it's a 200 million plus partnership in the in its first step. You don't think of it that way. It's a multi-billion dollar partnership is the way I view it. It's the, the very first step is to get acquainted, to bring the two communities together, uh, for us to own some Luna, for us to own and use some UST and vice versa. And so, uh, so there is a swap of uh, tokens. And in essence, what Doe announced is that, um, is that in continuing what he started. He started by building a two-coin system. He then decided to diversify the collateral into Bitcoin. He said he was going to buy one billion worth of Bitcoin. He ended up buying three, I believe, or is, is on his way towards buying three. And he wants to, uh, to set the goal at 10 for now, 10 billion of BTC. And the second diverse collateral he picked was Avalanche. And he has a very nice long tweet thread describing why. For you guys, you know why it's obviously the happening coin. It's the coin where the community is there. It's a real community of actual users. It's, it lives up to its promises, under promises, over delivers, and, uh, and is, is run by adults who know what they're doing. So that's, I think, the set of, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot more to the value proposition, but that I think is the meta value proposition for Avalanche. So, uh, so clearly, um, in his mind, it was Bitcoin, then Avalanche. And in our mind, it was it's time to work with another large community, another happy community, another community at the forefront of science that's doing everything, uh, exec do, doing the execution right. So um, uh, let's see what's next on the uh, on this on the slide deck. I think uh, this aligning ecosystems is uh, is the the picture. We're trying to align the Terra and, and Avalanche ecosystems. And uh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to announce this first step. It starts out as a hundred million dollar worth of uh, of, uh, of backing store, of Ox backing store, and um, there is going to be uh, so LFG, which is a great acronym, by the way, the Luna Foundation, I think, um, uh, is going to uh, uh, be uh, adding a hundred million dollars worth of Ox, which isn't all that much, but it's the first step. So you. you Climb Everest by putting one small step in front of one other small step. So that's uh, that's the first of a series of steps from from uh, from the folks at Terra to uh, to align our uh, our respective projects and bring our communities together. We in turn will be using UST. So uh, let's be uh, let's be clear about this. We will also be using USDT, USDC, as we have been at Ava Labs. We use those for payment internally um, and. Uh, uh, they're just wonderful, far more convenient than any other means of payment I've dealt with, way more convenient than any bank wire. And um, it's, uh, it's in a world such as ours, it's absolutely essential to have more diverse ways of capturing value. 
And given the current circumstances, given what we saw recently, and by recently, I would say last five years, um, what did we see? We saw the weaponization of finance. We saw Trump turn to a bunch of countries and say, I, sh I will destroy your economy. And he's not throwing empty threats. So economic weapons have always been within the arsenal of big powers, big players at any time. Any fiat-backed store can have its fiat taken. Tether, for example, has means in it. It has to have these means in it for, for uh, zeroing, for freezing, given account balances. So uh, that's just part of, uh, of life in the fiat world. Uh, you can have an edict come down to you, and if you're a centralized operation with any centralized operator, um, an edict can come, can come down whatever jurisdiction you are beholden to, and you are beholden to some, right? Um, so wherever you are, the long arm of the law will find you and you will get something in the mail that says you have to freeze these assets, you have to do this, that, and the other. So in a world such as that, we need decentralized ways of capturing value. And algorithmic stable coins have emerged to fill that gap. These things don't have a backing store. Okay? So they are, they are not like fiat-backed stable coins. Uh, they get their value, the, the stable side gets its value from the, the game theoretic actions of the people who hold the second coin. So there's UST. If UST is below $1, it's a good ARB to buy it and then sell it later when it's above a dollar and uh, to play that game, to market make in essence, to do arbitrage in essence around that shelling point of $1. And uh, if it drops substantially, then there's all sorts of economic incentives for people to convert their Lunas no, to convert the USDs back into Lunas to take USD out of circulation to try to create scarcity and prop up the price. Now, we should talk about whether or not this is sound, okay? So there are these things are sound to the extent that everybody believes that the system is working. There's that. And they can lose, they can depeg. It's, there's, we are under no illusion that somebody has invented some kind of a better mousetrap that allows one to create a magically pegged token. These magically pegged tokens, if one were to exist, the central bankers would have been implementing them already, right? Well, look at Argentina, look at Mexico, look at Turkey. You know, people have been, it's just, they've been hunting for such a thing and it's its just, it's elusive. There is no algorithmic solution to the, the, uh, the preservation of value. So DPEX can always happen. Now, is it the case that central bankers might have missed what's under their noses because they are, you know, the human element is there. They're too easily corrupted by politicians who want to print money during times of crisis, etc. It could be. It could be that these, these algorithmic solutions are actually pretty strong and they will withstand the test of time. It's possible. Um, but it's possible that there are issues here that in case of a giant drop in confidence, in case of a giant drop in value on the volatile side, then it might be difficult to preserve the peg on the stable side. This can happen. Now, um, at this point now, what do we do? I think one thing that we can say is, okay, we, we give up. Okay, As a scientist, we can't prove that this is going to work, and therefore we just you know poop all over it and we poo-poo the whole idea. I think that's wrong. I think that's stupid. I think we've seen empirically that the maker team managed to maintain the die value for a very long time. And over time, they ended up doing exactly what Doe has been, has been starting to do, which is diversify the collateral and change the operation. But DAI kept its value. Similarly, I think as long as the team behind the, 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 the effort knows what they're doing, as long as that team is committed to preserving the, uh, the value of the USD of the stable side, then uh, these things uh, actually are a pretty strong mechanism for creating the right sort of gradient around the shelling point of $1. I know I will come in if UST drops to a certain level. I don't know if you will, but I know I will. And uh, and I have a number in mind. I'm not gonna tell you guys because then you'll go a one cent above me and deprive me of my opportunity to make money. But I know I will and I know others will as well. So uh, as long as that's the case, I remain pretty confident that this is going to, uh, the, the mechanisms are going to work well. In addition, as long as the team behind it is good, this is going to work well. I'm going to come back to this topic, uh, but I'm, I'm so thrilled to be working with the best in this field, the, the algorithmic stable coin with the most value behind it, and uh, the team that is aggressively pursuing the strategy as their core being. So uh, that is the, uh, the Luna Terra folks, and uh, Doe and team have been nothing but fantastic to work with. And uh, 
So we're tying the lunatics and Terra builders together with the avalanche folks. Uh, that's going to be great. And um, uh, let's see, let's go further forward. Um, so, oh, this is happening on the, on the heels of the X anchor implementation on avalanche. And so we're expecting the Terra native DeFi protocols to come over. I just did a survey, by the way, this morning of the DeFi components on avalanche. And there is not a single one on Ethereum that is not represented equivalently or better in Avalanche. So I think that's a pretty good situation. Um, I'm not talking about NFT marketplaces. I'm not talking about other stuff. I'm talking solely about the DeFi Legos. And, uh, and I'm thrilled to have that. It would be wonderful to get some of the interesting projects and applications from, uh, from Terra Luna over to, uh, to us. Um, that would be fantastic. I think Anchor was one of them. So, uh, so it's cool and uh, it would be great to have. But, uh, and I'm also thrilled, by the way, about the fact that we have every DeFi category on Avalanche and we have some categories where we have absolutely the cutting edge. So Platypus comes to mind easily, but there are many others uh, where we are far ahead of, uh, of, of other people. So, uh, okay. And then we're going to be building a uh, gaming subnet together. I think this is going to be kind of fun. I don't have uh, anything else to say on this topic except Subnets are fantastic. They're a way to scale. They're the, the best way to scale. I've been telling the world for a long time. They don't get it. And uh, what they don't get is your opportunity because, you know, like there's these people, like you can talk to them at length and they will still say stupid shit to you. Like, oh, weak subjectivity. What about weak subjectivity? Um, or whatever they say, you know, what about shared security? So these are just bad frameworks. I think in the early days, the Ethereum folks tried to, to match one by one, feature by feature, everything that Bitcoin was doing. And in so doing, they reinvented a whole lot of terms that, uh, uh, and then they created a bunch of frameworks that are just, just the wrong framework. If you buy into the framework, you've already gone down the wrong path. You're gonna come up with a very, very bad solution that ends up uh, not meeting what the market needs. So anyway, so that's uh, sort of uh, the big alpha here. Um, that we're not doing that. And uh, I try to share with you my way of looking at, at the world. I'll try to do that today. Um, but, uh, but I think, uh, you know, that, that's, that's really the most important mistake to not make, which is don't buy into an incorrect framework that's going to lead you down into a rat hole. Um, so I'm thrilled about this, uh, the subnet approach, and uh, we're going to talk about that later. Thrilled about the opportunity to do something with uh, the Terra folks. Thrilled about uh, doing some gaming thing with them and doing a specialized subnet with them. So, um, uh, so yeah, we're going to be collaborating. It's going to be fantastic. So collaboration is pretty critical. I love this. And, uh, you know, um, we're going to see more of the L1s band together and create mutual value. So this is a good step for us, I think, uh, for the Avalanche community and uh, to couple up with uh, another community that's seen tremendous growth. So, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is Kanav uh, saying the exact same thing. It's a uh, commitment to a multi-chain future. Um, are we still on, I'm on the same page here? Yeah, Kanav. And, and yeah. Um, it's USD-centric DeFi ecosystem cross-pollinating with a gaming subnet. Avox is a high-quality reserve asset. Oh, I should say a few things about this. Why is Avox a high-quality reserve asset? Well, first of all, there's uh, it's got all the same economics as BT BTC. It's a hard capped asset. It's not a mint box. It's not something that's constantly being minted. There's only so many of them. And um, it's, uh, it's, uh, the distribution is uh, not relegated mostly to, to VCs or in fact, even in, in, in a substantial way to VCs. Uh, the VC participation has been quite limited in, uh, in the Avox distribution. Sometimes I worry about this. Sometimes I feel like, oh, you know, well, what would have happened? What if I had done a more asinine play? What if we had sold far less to the public in the early days? Uh, what if uh, what if we had reduced float? You know, what if uh, what if the number of tokens outstanding was tiny right now? Then the price would be would be more volatile. Um, but uh, you know, it would be it would be it would be a different world. And uh, and then I go, I would not have. I don't. I would. I cannot personally change anything that. I would not never ever have uh, changed anything that I did. It would have been the wrong thing to do. We were always community focused. We were always community first. You know, this isn't a game of, you know, let's make the number go up while we hold on to all the coins. 
if you want that game, there's a coin out there. Um, I'm not going to even name that. It's like they're trying to engage with me quite a bit. Uh, it's a coin out there. They have more more lawsuits than I can count. The very own people who worked on the coin are suing the guy in charge of the coin, and he's trying to detract attention by uh, by picking a fight with us. This is really funny. So uh, so we we that is exactly the opposite of us, and. Uh, and uh, and I think it's uh, it's fantastic that Avax was never never ever sold to uh, to VCs in bulk, and uh, and in fact uh, the the community participation was far in excess of our seed round participants, for example. So um, it's very much held by you all. Its success will be your success. So we're in this together, and uh, and I, I love that fact. And it's it's been it's been incredibly good for us. So, uh, win, win, win. Yes, that's right. It's a win, win, win situation, as Kanav says. And, um, and uh, yeah, we're doing this gaming thing. I can't say anything about it. And uh, I love GameFi, though. I think GameFi is gonna, going to be one of the next big things after NFTs. NFTs are kind of like, uh, they're not going to go all that far. Um, you know, I, it's, uh, there's a lot to be discussed about NFTs. We should at some point, um, you know, uh, but... Uh, but it's time for those NFTs to start having a life, to start being useful for things, to, to start playing a role in games. And we're going to see those games come, come to fruition. We just saw it happen. I'm going to come back to this in a second with DFK. Uh, but uh, uh, but it's, uh, we're going to see more of it, and it's going to be great to see. All right. So, um, oh, you're going to see a crap ton of crappy projects copy us. You've always seen a crap ton of crappy projects copy us. You guys remember Perlin? Perlin was supposed to be the bane of my existence. They were supposed to copy us. They were supposed to launch Avalanche. Uh, they were supposed to have these like whiz kids from Singapore or whatever. You know, I don't even know what happened to them. Uh, last I saw them, they were aggressively eating food together on a podcast. And uh, yeah, I don't know what the heck that was about. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then they were in my uh, AMAs trying to ask annoying questions. And I was like, I don't understand where this aggro attitude is coming from, given that you're copying our code as well as you know, uh, everything we worked on. Uh, so it's kind of weird. And then uh, predictably, they flared out. There is not a sign of Perlin. I don't know what the heck they're doing these days. It's just uh, relegated to the dustbin of history. It's just some shit project. You knew that the team had no, you know, they, they make a fizzle in social media. They had no staying power. So similar teams exist, okay? Similar teams exist because a bunch of VCs missed the avalanche boat, because a bunch of people missed the avalanche boat, and they're looking for the next of us. So there's a team that came right after us. Their claim to fame is they worked at Google or something, and then they have a YouTube channel. So, uh, But they're influential. Like if you have a YouTube channel and you live in the Bay Area, all the devs are going to listen to you. You're going to go to meetups. People will think you're kind of okay, kind of okay. Uh, you know, your asshole-ish ways are not going to show up when you go to those meetings. And uh, well, these guys have been total jerks. They uh, they held, uh, you know, these like big AMA sessions where they went on a, they did a whiteboarding session trying to prove why, why Avalanche will not work. And where are we now? They're like, I don't know where the hell they are, but uh, Avalanche works. Everything they said has been proven wrong. And uh, but these people are still going around, and now they're going to come up and uh, come up with their own stories of, oh, we're going to do everything that Avalanche is doing. So you'll see a bunch of other people either try to pair up with existing stable coins or launching their stable coins. There's a little known rule. Everybody knows the rule that goes, don't roll your own crypto. That's because the cryptographers among us have told everybody repeatedly, don't do this. This is specialized stuff. Small, subtle mistakes will render your thing worthless. We didn't do this in distributed systems. Arguably, we should have. Everybody thinks they can write a consensus protocol. None of those people are qualified. None. There's absolutely none. There are like a dozen people, maybe two dozen, who are qualified. We, and we know them all. And then anything that comes from outside that circle is just going to be like, eh. Um, in any case, so, uh, but there are a bunch of these. There, there are a bunch of other subtle things. Don't don't roll your own database. Don't don't be doing that. It's uh, you're going to screw that up. You're going to lose someone's data. Someone might die, and uh, it's just a bug to you, and it's it's a life to someone else. So so don't be doing those things. Another thing you should not do is roll your own stable coin. Do it yourself. Stable coin is uh, is hard. I mean, it's it's, it's uh, you know I say this as something. I'm a techie myself. I'm a coder. Maybe 
I'm a developer, a system architect, whatever I am. Um, but I have enough appreciation for finance. I live in New York City and I have enough of appreciation uh, to realize that this is really hard work. These people, you know, they're too busy trying to prove us wrong and doing whiteboarding sessions on YouTube or whatnot to realize how out of their depth they are. You know, you guys are just, you know, whatever it is, uh, tier, you know, whatever, zero tier programmers at Google. And um, you worked on something big at Google. That was Google's success. It wasn't your success. Now you're going to launch a coin and keep its value stable. Yeah, well, good luck to you. I'm going to be here with my popcorn and watching you all. It's going to be hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. So, um, so go launch, please. It's going to be amazing. Um, I'm going to look for ways to short. And um, uh, I give it two years before it comes crashing down. And uh, there's a reason why some coins are immensely successful and some coins just flounder. There have been so many other algorithmic stable coins and, um, and they, the, the effort required to keep them up, up to date is substantial. So, uh, so we're going to see what happens here. I am, I've got my popcorn handy and, uh, and I'm, I'm betting against every do-it-yourselfer in this space. So this is something that we decided not to do. We know that this is something that requires expertise and, uh, and a set of technologies that are not just tech tech, but fintech. And, um, and so Do Kwan and team are imminently cap capable of this. And uh, if you're gonna do your own, okay, power to you. So we'll watch you, uh, we'll watch your, uh, your, your popcorn that you create. All right, uh, there's something big going on on Tuesday. Do and I are going to do a Twitter spaces. It's going to be uh, much more interactive and uh, we'll talk about uh, what's coming up and we'll talk about what this this uh, partnership means for the respective uh, projects. So I'm excited about this. Let's go do this uh, this chat. It's on Tuesday. It's some at some god awful hour for both Do and me and you. I think it's 7 p.m. Eastern, and uh, and I think it's 7 a.m. Uh, time for him. So uh, so in any case, we'll we'll make it happen. All right. So uh, what's next? I think uh, you know. I think it's time to talk a little bit about architecture. Uh, about blockchain architecture, it's time to talk a little bit about different choices and differences between visions for how these things will evolve. So you might be familiar with monolithic blockchains. Here's an example of one. Here's Ethereum. And inside that box, there are, I don't know how many, I'm eyeballing about 20, 25 dots. Those are the miners. They are the only entities that are important when it comes to the generation of the Ethereum blockchain. You could have any number of watching nodes outside of the circle. None of them would matter. Okay, so when somebody gives me a node count and they say something like, oh, you know, Bitcoin has 5,000 nodes, none of them matter. Ethereum has blah, 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 thousand, none of them matter. Okay, so we have a gazillion of those nodes. We don't even count them because they don't matter. They don't generate blocks. They couldn't uh, detect censorship. They cannot. They can only detect invalid state changes. No one's going to do an invalid state change. You don't need, in, in fact, when it's your time to check for invalid state changes, the presence of those nodes doesn't help you either. You yourself have to check it on a node you trust. You have to run your own node. So it's only your node that protects you against invalid state changes. The presence of those additional nodes does nothing for you. They don't generate blocks. They don't check blocks for you. They're just there as onlookers. It's nice to have many of them. That's cool, but they add nothing. So we, we should focus on the block creators. And uh, uh, and when it comes to censorship proofness, you know the, those nodes do nothing whatsoever. So they're completely immaterial. But Ethereum today looks kind of like this. It's a monolithic chain. It's a proof of work chain. And this is what it looks like. It has a single API and, uh, and, uh, and then you submit transactions to it. It's got a uniform API. You know how to interact with it. It facilitates finance uh, through its unified API. This is Ethereum in the future. It's the L2 centric uh, future for Ethereum 2 and, um, and uh, you know, with the additional things on top. So you've got these new layer twos. You know, ZK Sync is up there, Optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, whenever it gets its act together and figures out a way to run a chain without going backwards, 
And then on top of that, they had the, the ability to, to build a layer two as opposed to a side chain, then they will be a layer two. But we're, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. I've never seen a country skip technology like that. I've never seen a project group skip. You know, you can't go from, uh, I don't know what, you can't go from walking everywhere to suddenly building a car. You have to have invented the bicycle in the process, right? So, uh, so but somehow maybe Polygon can do it. Let's, uh, let's hope for that. But so this is the new future, right? And an L L2 centric way. Um, now, if you do have a universe like this, it's pretty different from what you used to have. The API is no longer uniform. Liquidity is no longer in a single pool, it's divided. And um, what you do to interact with uh, smart contracts changes depending on where the smart contract is deployed. Think of it another way. You are a user of a chain and applications on top. What you have underneath you is everything you see when you look below you. So you've got the layer you're at, which is you're submitting transactions in some shape or form. You're dealing with a UI or whatever. And underneath that UI, there is a smart contract. And that smart contract is deployed on one of these layer twos and what it does and its semantics is very much affected by which layer two it's, it's deployed on, who it can call upon, how much it, value it has at its disposal, whether it can go backwards, when it can give you a response and so forth. It, that's all a, a function of where it's been deployed. And so the system as you see it depends on where you are. When you interact with an optimism deployed contract, then you see one system. When you interact with an Arbitrum deployed one, you see another one. When you see interact with a ZK sync one, you see another one. And if you're a developer, it's the other way around. To deploy something on ZK sync, you have to write your code in this funky language. It's a single assignment form, et cetera. You know, it's got a bunch of things going for it that make your life difficult and different from what it used to be when you were just learning solidity and compiling down to the Ethereum API in the previous universe. If you're building on optimism, it's a different universe altogether. Now you have to worry about fraud proofs. They're not implemented yet, so but one day they will be. And when they are implemented, and now you have to worry about, well, who's, who's gonna capture these fraud proofs? Who's gonna present them? Do I have enough people? Do I have enough funds uh, to be able to, to, uh, to contest invalid state changes that optimism might check in? Um, when do I actually present things as being final? so as to not fool my users and so on. These are all issues and problems. Arbitrum, you know, when do you check back in? When do you actually signal finality? So these are all, they change uh, depending on how you deploy. And I, I hope you can see that the fundamental appeal of the blockchain disappears when you go to an L2 universe. Each and every one of these L2s is a different API. You used to have this uniform thing and now for people who use this, then you have this weird warty thing. And for people who use this other thing, you have this other warty thing. You, you've got the core thing plus the wart. And uh, now you've got a bunch of different warts and now everybody has to figure out the properties of these warts and how to connect them and how to deal with them. So I think, you know, there are many other reasons for why L2 approach uh, is not an approach. It's just a, a way of saying, Hail Mary, you know, I will toss this ball into the air towards the end zone, and I hope one of my guys picks it up because I don't know how to carry it forward. So that's, I think, what we're seeing here with the L2 vision. And it's very different from, uh, from what you see with Avalanche and other systems. There was a very good tweet thread, um, I think I uh, sent it out, um, that talks about, about uh, that compares the, uh, the new approach to building uh, building blockchains. I think all but three chains, all but three, there are like 10,000 of these things, but like only three of us have a, uh, a heterogeneous model. Everybody else has a single monolithic model. What's a monolithic model? This is well, the one size fits all model. So, uh, so I think those three are uh, Cosmos, Polkadot, and Avalanche. And there are some substantial differences. And uh, and I, I want to sort of go through them a little bit and try to illustrate for you uh, what's, what's kind of different between them. So, um, you know, um, before I go there, I guess my next slide is this slide. Let's talk a little bit about this dog. This is my, can we go forward one? one yeah, the skipper key. This is my, uh, my, my quintessential example. 
for why you should you should not pick battles, pick fights with people who are not worth it, because you will turn into your enemy. So this is a dog. It's called a skipper key. Um, it's a dog that was bred to catch rats on ships. And uh, you can see that, you know, to catch rats on ships, you have to be small. You have to be able to get into those little holes between the, the, the keels, uh, the keel, keel joists. So, um, you know, and this dog over time kind of lost its dog-like qualities and turned into its worst enemy. And um, that's always a problem with, uh, with coins that compete too much with each other. They turn into each other. They end up picking up each other's, uh, each other's, um, uh, each other's features. So what you're going to see is uh, a whole bunch of people adopting the subnet approach. So um, I, I think they were oblivious and they were too busy competing with each other and they were turning into each other. A lot of other people in this space kept getting tripped up by this shared security business. Shared security is not a desirable feature. Let me say this again. Shared security is not what you want. Think about all the things you want, okay? So you've got a chain, I've got a chain. There are a bunch of things you might enunciate as things you like from my chain. Now, what are those things? You're gonna do business with me. You probably don't want my chain going backward, okay? That's like a reasonable thing. So that, that's a good property, no, no safety violations. You don't want double spends, right? You know, you don't want me going backwards and then spending differently because then I'll take my, I'll pretend to give money to you and then I'll take it back to myself. That's a, that's a reasonable thing to want. You don't want my chain stopping, right? So uh, uh, even though there are chains out there that have kind of normalized this, you know, like they, they have weekly stoppages, there's a chain that goes backwards on a daily basis. Okay, its name already came up today. Um, I don't know why it should never do that. A layer two should never do it. A side chain with finality should never go backwards. If, if your chain is going backwards, you're really screwing something up. And if you can't get that right, I don't think you're going to, you're not going to make it. It's an NGMI kind of situation. So uh, I, I would not bet against your technology. I'm betting against your team now. I think if you're that incompetent, it's going to be not so good for you. So, uh, so anyhow, there's a chain that, that does this go backwards thing. And then there are chains that, that halt. Halting is kind of okay. Like you can, you can have issues. Uh, but if you're halting oh, you're routinely, then you've got, you've got, again, another issue. Maybe that's, that there's something fundamentally wrong with the design there. But, um, but the important thing I want to, to mention is uh, shared security is not what anyone wanted. Like you didn't, of all the things that you enunciated when you wanted good things from me, you never would say, I want to die together with you. That's shared security. I want my fate intertwined with you. We, we want, you want to be Thelma and Louise with me. You know, you want to hold my hand, look into my eyes as I drive off a cliff or something. That's not something you'd want to do. You want to be alive, right? And if I'm stupid enough to go off a cliff, you want to be like, how stupid if you drove off the cliff. So, uh, so don't be like, that's not, it's not a desirable thing to have your fate intertwined with someone else. What you want is for the other person, for you to, two things. You want yourself to not die, not be unsafe, and you want the other person to not die and not be unsafe. That's all you care about. If you insist on top of this, that not only will you not die and, 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 uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and, and do things, and will I not die and do stuff, but we will do those things in an intertwined fashion forever, then you have really conjoined us. Then you and I have shared fate in such a tight manner that I cannot execute any faster than you. And if that's what you want, then you're not gonna get scale. It's just, this is obvious distributed systems 101. It's not something I made a big song and dance about in, on the internet because the maxis will come at me and they'll create a lot of noise and so forth. But you know, there's just low IQ thinking. Shared security is stupid. Shared security prohibits you from using other people's resources. I just want, you know, if I'm chain A, I've got chain B over there, I want chain B to be as diverse as possible, to be its own thing, to have its own life, and to be so decentralized, as decentralized as me, but with different nodes, with unshared resources. I explicitly want lack of shared resources. 
I want your failure modes to be independent from my failure modes. So that's all I have to say about this. And, uh, and there are a bunch of people who did not get the memo. They're building their systems in the wrong way. You know, power to them. And uh, they will end up uh, discovering that they are creating all kinds of bottlenecks. So, um, but you know, a lot of this was never about the bottlenecks in the first place. A lot of it was a, was a supremely asinine play to create a limited resource, a, 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 a falsely limited resource, and then to sell the, the, that resource. These slots, these auctions, like whatever, something zone auctions or whatever they're called, parachain auctions on Polkadot. There is no technical justification for why, why you should do that. It makes no sense to me. So um, uh, I don't know why they have a limit of only 100 parachains. It might be because they have shared security and they realize they can't handle more than more than a certain number of, uh, you know, of, of subnetworks. The avalanche model is different. We can have any number of subnetworks. These subnetworks can fail independently. That's true. And that's fine. So this is a situation where I or you or, or anyone else just lacks the authority to come and say, you must have a, a bare minimum level of decentralization and it must match the amount of decentralization in the main network. It's, who am I to dictate that? There are many people who are, who are happy, depending on the application, with a smaller set of validators. So we have, I, as far as I can tell, the only architecture that allows anyone to determine their own level of decentralization. These sub-networks have their own validators. They do their own stuff. And uh, people who use uh, resources on those subnets have to be careful when, uh, when they go to them much in the same way that they have to be careful when they go to a layer two, by the way. The layer twos have all of these issues, plus more in spades. Layer twos are all centralized at the moment, almost all of them. There's one experimental thing that supposedly exists in someone's mind in design form, but not an implementation form that could be decentralized. But every extant L2 on Ethereum is, is fully, fully centralized. There's a single operator running it. I don't know why they don't run them faster. I don't know why they don't run them cheaper. Um, so uh, in any case, these are all off topic. I'm being super tangential today. I'm all over the place. But, uh, but I did promise that this was sort of a, sort of a window into how, how we think about things. And so I kind of do make a point of going into these tangents just to share with you um, what I think. So layer twos are just, you know, they're just centralized money grabs. You give all of the MEV to the centralized operator in most of them. And, uh, and it's, uh, you know, many of them don't even have uh, any of the security mechanisms that ought to be there, like fraud proofs and so forth. So, um, uh, so it's, it's important whenever you're using a tech like that to make sure that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that it's, it's up to, to your definition of, of uh, security. And uh, in Avalanche, this is left up to the subnet creators. And... Um, uh, it's super flexible. You can have a subnet consisting of a small number of validators. You can have subnets with large numbers of validators. And if our community is cognizant of what's necessary here, then we will see a flourishing space of validators. A new validator economics will emerge. People will start giving extra incentives to create the kind of diverse validator sets that they need. And others will start running validation services that can come in and provide that diversity, geographic, political, et cetera, that, uh, that these chains might need. And the chains will then decide to decide on that trade-off for themselves. Not everybody needs a thousand validators. We can absorb it. Some people need millions and we can do that too. Uh, but some people can get by with smaller numbers and they should be able to do that. So, so that's how we designed it from the get-go. It's a sensible thing. Now you're going to see a whole lot of people start to, to, uh, to copy a lot of it. Okay, let's move on a little bit. So security and decentralization. Somebody went and measured, uh, uh, measured uh, the Nakamoto coefficient. What is the Nakamoto coefficient? It's, um, it's an effort to try to figure out the narrowest bottleneck to decentralization in a system. The smaller the number, the smaller the bottleneck. And so here you can see that of all these systems that have been examined in this study, um, Avax is, is 
by far the top one in terms of decentralization. This is no surprise to me. I don't know what these numbers mean. I don't have an intuitive way of mapping 26 to something I understand, but I gather it's a high number and a high is good and it's higher than these competitors and I'm not the least bit concerned, you know, surprised. Of course, you know, the, we, we worked from day one. We have the world's most decentralized platform. The protocol is, is fantastic for adding more people. And, uh, and of course, these, uh, you know, these things that are, you know, boomer vehicles for people who've missed the Avox boat. I see it. I see it right there. Obviously, you know, it's just sold to VCs in bulk and uh, they're doing some asinine play now. They've all, all they've done is uh, try to shit talk us and then copy us. They even copied uh, our, uh, what well, we had a failure during our public sale, our ICO. And then they also had a failure <laughs> because our ICO went so well. They copied even the, oh, you know, our, our sale failed, sale had a problem. We're going to extend it by seven weeks. And, and I know what I, I went through in those seven weeks, in seven days um, that we extended the sale. It was stressful for us. It was a real failure. It was unanticipated. And, uh, and now you've got these cargo cultures copying even that. And now they're going to try to copy a stable coin. That's great. Let's try and copy a whole bunch of things. If you're a boomer out there, go, go for it. You know, you missed the Vox. You missed a whole bunch of things. And uh, you probably bought some BTC. And uh, here are a bunch of kids from uh, San Francisco. They're, they're famous for uh, having worked at Google. Nobody else has, just them. And uh, so, you know, you can go to their, uh, their little coin. Anyhow, um, but uh, here we are. Um, we are we're the most decentralized of these things. Not surprising. It's very cool to see. Okay, let's take a look at, uh, shall we change gears a little bit? Let me finish my coffee. Okay, so uh, uh, let's see. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, subnets and performance. We talked a little bit about uh, what that means. And here is a fantastic graph of the DeFi Kingdom subnet. They launched a subnet on us maybe 10 days ago. And um, I think I talked to you a little bit about it. But you can see what happened here. The graph to the left shows something amazing. What is that amazing thing? Take a look. You are seeing the purple stuff is, is the number of transactions on the C chain. Okay. So it's roughly, it sits like, I think on this day, it was about 90% of Ethereum. Ethereum's load. You can see that the subnet was maybe, I don't know what, maybe one and a half times, was itself doing 1.5 times Ethereum's load, while the C chain was doing about 90% of Ethereum's load. And so we managed to take on one and a half extra Ethereum's load without any impact whatsoever on the main net. Okay? This is what subnets can do. This is what shared security cannot do okay all those people they're going to repeat a whole bunch of buzzwords like this it's it's i just every time i hear shared security i don't even correct it i just go uh-huh like this and i mark this person as, as a cloudy thinker and i just go okay whatever this person's never gonna reform uh they don't understand how to really scale anything and this is not a person to whom i look for uh, scalability advice or suggestion or critique they, they've 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 lost the plot so um, this is exactly what you can do with our approach. And uh, subnets are amazing. Uh, when this, this pink peak was happening, the fees on C-Chain were unaffected, not the least bit affected at all. The load was completely absorbed by the gaming subnet dedicated to DFK. So I expect many other chains to start their, many other games to start their own GameFi chain. It's going to be fantastic to watch. And, um, and so they will go and do their own thing. They will have their own performance isolation. They will have their own failure isolation. And uh, uh, they will be decentralized to the extent that their communities want them to be decentralized. So um, it's a fantastic universe. It's going to unleash for us a new economy for validators. And it's going to show to the world that what you need to succeed is not a bazillion different ways of of growing your system by growing warts on it, but to have instead a coherent, uniform strategy with a unified API that anyone can adopt. That pink thing, it has the exact same API as the blue thing, exact same. So using it requires no special tooling. 
You don't have to rewrite your smart contract in a different language. You don't have to compile it down to a different form. Its semantics are no different. This is important. It doesn't, it's not on a weird substrate where everything goes backwards or whatever. It's, uh, it's, it just operates the exact same way as the blue one. You know what to trust. You know how it works. It works exactly like the Avalanche network because it uses the Avalanche protocol. It's the same protocol. The way you reason about that is the same as the way you reason about the blue one. And uh, I don't know if this makes, if this is sort of sinking in for you, but as a techie, that's the only thing I want to hear. The only thing. I, I want to know that, that my mental world, mental model for how the systems work should not have to change much. And, uh, and, uh, and if you, you know, I think the techies in the crowd are realizing, hey, this is so much easier than the L2 based model because you don't know which L2 is going to win. Today, it might, you know, it used to look like optimism was winning, but they can't seem to deliver the, the fraud proof. So maybe they're, they're kind of falling behind, you know, uh, uh, the other ones, I don't know which one's going to win. I don't know if I should write my application in this funky language for uh, ZK snarks or whatnot. You just don't know. It'll change. I don't know where liquidity will flow to, but it's very simple for subnets. You deploy on the subnet. And uh, if you don't like the subnet you're on, you can always, if you built in the mechanism for it to shut down and redeploy elsewhere, not hard. This is all doable. After all, you have a, a clear path, a clear vision for what's underneath you. Your trusted computing base doesn't arbitrarily change when you go from one location to another. The roadmap is in crystal clear. Okay, so I come under some kind of uh, criticism every now and then. We don't like to, I don't like to publish roadmaps because we have all these copycats that are just constantly trying to pick out the scraps from our table and and, and make a big song and dance about them. So, um, uh, and then there are also teams that have nothing but roadmaps. You know, there's always some Godot. Godot will arrive. And when he arrives, boy, is it gonna be glorious. And at any one time, Godot is always like 18 months out, three months out, five months out. So uh, uh, we're neither of those things. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but I think our roadmap is, is crystal clear, should be crystal clear to any techie. We will build exactly what we said we would. Um, networks and sub-networks based on the Avalanche protocol. They will be delightful to use. They provide the same interface to all builders. Very straightforward stuff. And that straightforwardness itself carries value, at least to me and people like me who like elegant, simple, clean systems. If you are one of them, consider building on Avalanche. All right, so uh, let's see. So there, here are a bunch of numbers. Um, subnet activity, yeah, we had like a crap ton of activity, about uh, twice as much in total for the whole day. Um, C chain plus the subnet was in excess of Ethereum. Um, you know, there was the, the, the thing that I showed you earlier was a smaller time uh, uh, time granularity. And um, this is kind of cute. So uh, Cardano is a system I happen to like. I said this the other day. And uh, people got upset at me, but I was just saying, look, Cardano has total value locked of $334 million. It's been around for a long time. I've known Charles Hoskinson for a very long time. I've been having conversations with him for a very long time. I guess their days from launch is 2,555 days. The DeFi Kingdom chain in one day ended up collecting more total value locked than Cardano in one day. It has 345 million. This is not to diss Cardano. All the Cardano people get really upset. So then I had to do a clarification saying, I actually like Cardano. I like Charles. Charles has been, uh, you know, he has a past with Ethereum that I don't know. Uh, and there, there are a bunch of Ethereum people who hold strong opinions about him. I'm not one of them. So Charles on Cardano has been on point. He has actually worked very hard to work with researchers and to get, get in the cutting edge of research into Cardano. And um, I very much respect that. So, you know, um, I think they did the best they could with the technology circa their launch date. And um, they ended up, uh, they ended up building uh, something interesting, um, you know, based on the information available at the time. I haven't had the, uh, the, I guess what I don't have is the life expectancy. If I had another extra 20 years to live, 
I would probably spend some more time reading that uh, Ouroboros Prowse paper in more detail. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's an interesting system, but, uh, but I haven't been able to digest that paper myself. It's too complex for me, and I think it's too complex for quite a few other people. The proofs are, uh, are, are, are rather complicated, and um, in a lot of these cases, there's something that's, that's missed in the model, and to find that requires diligent, difficult study, which I haven't done. So um, to me, it's a, it's a little complicated looking, and the, the, the complexity of the proofs is a little unnerving for me. But Cardano is a perfectly fine system, and uh, they worked really hard to get to where they are. They have a lot of uh, connections, um, it seems, to, to the Middle East. So that's good. Um, and then the DFK chain comes along and in one day outdoes all of that effort. So um, it's amazing. Subnets work. They're, they're just a great technology. And everyone knows how they work. Everyone knows how to interact with them. It's fairly straightforward. Oh, we got this to happen. This is actually a very good outcome. Uh, we got subnets on DeFi Llama. So I hope to grow this list. Uh, I think you can see here that the DFK system, uh, the DFK uh, universe is uh, underneath the avalanche heading. So uh, check the right checkboxes so, so as not to miss any of these subnets. And uh, we have a new subnet explorer. Um, I think uh, it's going to be more and more important to provide tooling for these, uh, these systems. Uh, we don't want... Uh, uh, we don't want them, uh, you know, we want the, the experience to be uniform. So explorer.avox.network supports subnets. You're going to see them support more. And uh, I'm excited about this. And um, and so what's the future? Well, Oprah is right here telling us the future. You got a subnet, you got a subnet, everyone gets a subnet. Not everyone. And uh, what I think we, we really should get is, um, is something slightly different. It's, um, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, you're going to see that uh, related related smart contracts will be deployed on the same network. They will be deployed on the same subnet. And uh, those that need for their own performance isolation, for their own fee management, for their own legal reasons, they need a different set of validators. They can and should do that. And this is not something that people can do in their shared security model or what have you. So, um, so this is uh, it's a great situation to be in. And uh, people are at the door trying to break into where I live, I guess. So I'm going to have to go. Um, and, uh, and so this sort of summarizes what I think. What do I think? I think we're at the cusp of a lot of exciting developments. That's what I think. I think that my team has been working incredibly hard. I know I've been. I know I lost my voice. I think you can hear that it's not fully back yet. I'm going to try to nurse it this weekend and hopefully come back to you next week with an actual working more velvety, more Elvis-like voice, um, and uh, but uh, uh, but you know it's going to be an interesting time, and uh, and I can't wait uh, I can't wait to uh, to come and uh, to, to talk to you about the future of, of blockchains. I think uh, the summit event was fantastic for us. I think uh, that uh, people are beginning to understand that the avalanche approach is fundamentally different. The traders won't. To them, everything looks the same. And the rotators, I think this is the lowest form of life. You know, you just go from one token to another thinking that everybody else is doing the same. And uh, it's okay. You're trying to eke out like a percent here, a percent there. And uh, it's just fine. It's fine. You know, well, why not? You could do that, I guess. But really, the important thing here is in the long term, there's going to be a few winning chains. These winning chains will have the architecture to absorb growth. We're not going to win by carving out people from each other. Maybe we can a little bit, but that's not what I'm focusing on. There's, the growth here is going to be so huge that the people with the right architecture are going to be able to eat it up. I showed you the right architecture. I showed it to you years ago. I'm showing it to you now, I guess, with more details and pictures now that uh, we have a working product. And, uh, and I'm not going to get drawn into any of these Twitter social media fights there's the people who win these fights are the ones who, who do nothing but generate content and verbiage for social media. That's not what I do. It's not what we do. We're building stuff. And so you're going to see more successes like the DFK subnet deployed. And they're going to run and they're going to give people what they want, which is a delightful experience with a blockchain with the, with the strength of the blockchain guarantees behind it. So that's where we're headed. Come on board and we'll build amazing things together. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend.